Talk amongst yourselves. I'm just letting everybody know this is February 7th, Super Bowl Sunday, right? I wore my browns, both my sweatshirt and an undershirt with browns, or a t-shirt with a browns on it for next year because we will be in the Super Bowl, right? Yeah. Coach of the year, too. So, yeah. <laughs> so we're gonna get started this morning. Uh, we call it worship, but it's a time that Hopefully you can push everything else out of your mind and just say, Jesus, come. I want to uh, just be present with you. He is worthy of all of our praises. Amen? Amen. 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 He is worthy. He's faithful. And, and that's really wherever you're at, um, he's with you. So we just, we just say thank you, Lord, because we can do the things that we think we can do and say, you know, here's our offering, but you want our hearts. So we give you our hearts this morning. And maybe if where you're, wherever you're at, just say, Lord, have my heart this morning. We thank you for that. We thank you for that. Amen. Amen.
couldn't stop the Lord Almighty. Nobody.
are faithful. Your promises are yes and amen. And you are King of glory. You are the Lord of my heart, both the Lord of, of everyone here, Lord of our hearts. Thank you for leading us in worship today, Jesus. We continue to give our hearts minds and we just ask continue to open things within us to just hear magnificently your word. We ask this in your name. Amen. Well, good morning. Welcome, Vineyard. Wherever you are, we're so glad and excited that you've come to join us today. If you want a copy of today's bulletin, it is available on our flock notes. Today, Pastor Brent is preaching from a sermon series entitled Ephesians, A New Humanity. Today's message is Walking in the Way of Love as a New Humanity, Ephesians 5, 1 through 20. Kingdom Kids, all kids and families out there, Paul Busby and Torso Bob have a Kingdom Kids series. Jesus said, what? <laughs> Jesus said, what? What? You will learn who Jesus is and how they can trust him completely. And you can find it on our church website at clevelandvineyard.com under Kids Ministry. So check out uh, Mr. Busby and... Or so, Bob. And speaking of kids, welcome, welcome to the world, to the McBride family. They have a new daughter, Bridget McBride. Congratulations to Charlie, Tracy, Emily, Connor, Finn, Abby, and Declan as the Kingdom Kids pipeline continues. <laughs> welcome, we're excited. Uh, don't forget, chat with a pastor uh, every Wednesday from 10 to 11. You can uh, join a Zoom chat with one of the pastors. Uh, be short devotional, followed by time to simply chat. If you're interested, contact Brent at Brent Pauls, not Paulson, just Pauls, at gmail.com for the Zoom link. Now, before I came into church this morning, I Parked my car at the ministry house. I stomped through the snow. I put my tithe plus 10 check in the little box on the steps beside the ministry house. You can do that, but there's so many easier ways to give. You can mail it to the church. You can give on our church website through PayPal, or you can give through Facebook. And again, reminder to keep our church moving in the midst of the hard times. Continue your gifts. Also, uh, if you need contribution statements, you need to uh, email Teresa, TeresaPauls at gmail.com. Again, because of the changes in the tax laws, most people don't itemize, so we're only sending them out to those that request it. So if you need a contribution statement, why uh, let Teresa know that by Gmail. We will see you next week. We'll be right here, and you can safely uh, check us out on Facebook or YouTube. God bless, and here comes Pastor Brent for a great message. Good morning. Thanks to, oh, I'm not on? No, you are. Oh, I am on. Okay. Good. We're um, thankful to Zane and to Jim for setting up our sound system. So 
each week we ask for your grace and patience as we try out new things to, um, to get just the best quality sound we can to your homes. Um, our goal ultimately is to be able to project ourselves live into each and every one of your living rooms or to actually have you come back here and worship with us. That's the ultimate goal. So um, this morning, hopefully you can hear. Okay, if you can't, you can always text on Facebook and say, hey, I can't hear anything. That helps us know that you can't hear anything. So um, let's pray. Father, we come into a time when our world is really crazy and life is really crazy. And I was thinking about the Apostle Paul this week and about how he was able to um, just rejoice and be joyful even in the midst of imprisonment, in the midst of Roman occupation, in the midst of persecution, and all these things. And, and Father, I believe that was because he had a deep, deep vision and picture of your greatness and of your glory, and he lived a life of thanksgiving. We pray that we would be able to do that today, too, that you'd take us from our, our kind of um, our land-based thinking and bring us into heavenly thinking. And I pray this in your name, Jesus, and help me to deliver your message today in power and in grace. Amen. There's a famous hymn called Just As I Am. It used to be super famous. Some of you who are familiar with Billy Graham and with his crusades back uh, many years ago. He was an amazing evangelist and speaker. He spoke to... Um, uh, millions of millions of people across the United States and the world, and um, actually, him and uh, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. used to travel sometimes together and went down to South America and did some team ministry stuff down there. But um, this song, "Just as I Am," was also the song of uh, one of our famous actresses who died just this last the end of January. Cicely Tyson, whom, according to many of my black women friends, would be considered um, uh, royalty in our country if we had such a thing as royalty. She was an amazing lady who um, was able to accomplish amazing things in a very difficult time. In fact, it's, it writes in, this is a, a magazine called Faith, and it says, this about Sicily it says the iconic actress who opened doors to black actors in Hollywood on, on Broadway died at 96 it was reported Thursday January 28th Tyson's death comes a day after the star released her first ever autobiography Tyson a believer titled her book written by, with the story architect uh, Michelle Buford just as I am after the Christian hymn, she, had so, uh, she held as her close testimony all these years. In Just As I Am, the pioneering star of stage and screen reveals that church was the cornerstone of her childhood and the place where she, she learned to overcome her shyness. Tyson was a child of West Indian parents, called it a blessing to have been raised in Bas Baptist and Episcopal back backgrounds. Tyson also went through some very difficult times in life, she, um, one, one way I read is that she persevered in spite of racism, bigotry, sexism, hurt, heartbeat that tried to knock her down and used the experiences along with the faith as clay to mold her into the woman she wanted to be. Her exposure to ignorance and bigotry on a national scale while promoting Sounder led her to a defining moment in her career. She made a silent pact with herself to choose these projects and roles that would offer the opportunity to use her career as a platform to combat racist, combat racist stereotypes. As a result, Tyson never played a prostitute, maid, addict, or any other role relegated to black women. Another pivotal moment in Tyson's um, un was, demonstrates Tyson's unwillingness to be deterred in her acting career path, despite, despite several attempts to do just that by a man in Hollywood. Um, his name was um, Paul Mann, who sexually assaulted uh, Tyson in 1956. History recorded him as a celebrated teacher, one who prepared numerous luminaries for the stage. Yet in my book, 
I will forever, he will forever be regarded as the man whom along, along with my path towards providence hurled a brick, one that I picked up and threw back at him. And then to end the story of Tyson's life, she writes this, and this is a good word for all of us, I think, and it really summarizes my message today. She says this, The way I see it, God isn't finished with me. When I've completed my job, he'll take me. Until then, I've got plenty to do, Tyson writes. The award-winning star concludes her book with a message to black women in part saying, I want to go home knowing that I'm loved generously, even if imperfectly. I want to feel as if I embodied our humanity so fully that it made us laugh, laugh and weep. And that will remind us of our shared families. I want to be recalled as one of the as one who squared my shoulders in the service of black women and who made us walk taller and envisioned greater for ourselves. I, I want to know that I did the very best I could do with, that God gave me, just as I am. And so what a beautiful picture of somebody who dedicated their life to not only um, the will of God and the purposes of God, and saw her life as reflected in the song, Just As I Am, but also to a woman who was able to engage a sometimes very hostile country and world and was able to speak powerfully and, and um, influentially both with her um, regular voice and also her acti acting voice and, um, and be able to bring some great change. And so this is our first person that we're celebrating in Black History Month. Tis Cicely Tyson, who now is with our Lord Jesus. And so today we're going to talk about what that looks like to walk a life of integrity. What does it look like to walk the Christian life? For the first several chapters of Ephesians, Paul has talked about all the things that God has done for you. He's loved you. He's chosen you, he's predestined you to be his children, he's adopted you as his children, he's seated you at the right hand of the Father, he's seated you in his presence in the heavenlies, even in the present age. He's forgiven of all of us, all of our sins and trespasses and wickedness. And he's destined us to a purpose that goes far beyond anything that we could ever have imagined. And in, the, in this same way, Paul now gives directions on what does it look like to live as a Christian in the present age. He's not saying that there are certain ways to live to become a Christian. He's saying that because you have become a Christian, because Jesus has come into your life by, by grace, this is how we live distinctively from the world around us. And Paul isn't saying here that we should live... Um, separated from the world. Many people pick that out of Scripture, and so we have these enclaves and cliques of Christians that go from place to place and never encounter anybody in the world. And I don't think that's what Paul is saying at all. That's not what our Savior did, did he? Did Jesus hang out? Did he uh, avoid anybody who was, was sexually broken or sexually promiscuous or was greedy or was an idolater or was whatever? No. He, that's exactly the place he put himself. But part of what he did is he didn't let that influence him. He became the thermometer that set the temperature in the room of life that the people were living in, and their lives began to change as they were flooded with his light and his love. It began to transform them into beautiful images of children of God. And so Paul says this as, as words and challenges to us. And I'll, I'll begin this, and it actually the first whole part talks about sexuality. And we'll get into that, why it talks about sexuality in, in a minute. But um, if you know anything about our world or about world history, you'll realize that, that sexuality and our sexuality and how we live out our sexuality and that most of our sexuality comes not from God, not from Christians, not from church, but it comes from our society. And I'm, I'm not, you know, one of the things I've discovered after 40-some years of being a Christian, that society isn't always the best place to get our morality. 
It's not always the best place to say, well, this is what everybody's saying we should do. Maybe I should do this. I mean, I come from a, I come from a state where every winter a whole group of people, whoops, my little windscreen popped off here. I'll put it back on just so I don't poof you to death. There's nothing worse than being poofed on a Sunday morning. Let me get this hooked up to my two. I go and, and then I wear my my kind of uh, indigenous shirt today, which isn't conducive to microphones. But hang on a second. Let's see what we can do here. There we go. That might be better. Um, I just don't want to poof you. Um, I come from a country. I come from a state where where the predominant ethic in the winter is that you cut, that it's 30 below, and you go out on an ice, you go out on the ice, and you either build a big house and sit in there and fish all winter, and then you come out in the spring when the, when the house starts sinking, or else you cut a big hole in the ice, and you put a swimming suit on, and you jump in the water, and then you jump out of the water and scream, and take the rest of the winter to heal up. And so my, 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 trust in, in societal norms has been deeply tainted by my experiences growing up in Minnesota. So with that in mind, um, think about what Paul says in these following words. He says, so you should be imitators of God like dear children. Conduct yourselves in love just as the Messiah loved us and gave himself for us as a sweet smelling offering and sacrifice to God. As for fornication, uncleanliness of any kind. Fornication means sexual immorality on a whole le level of scales from premarital sex to pornography to all kinds of things. In fact, some of the words in here are pornea, which is pornography. Um, you shouldn't even mention them. You, after all, are God's holy people. Shameful, stupid, or coarse conversations are quite out of place. Instead, there should be thanksgiving. You should know this, you see. No fornicator, nor anybody who practices uncleanness, nor greedy person, in other words, an idolater, has any inheritance in the Messiah's kingdom or in God's. Don't let anyone fool you with empty words. It is because of these things you see that God's wrath is coming on the people who are disobedient. So don't share in their practices. After all, at one time you were darkness, but now in the Lord... You are light. Light has its fruit, doesn't it? In everything that's good and just and true. That's what light brings. That's what the fruit of righteousness, the fruit of the Spirit is. Everything that is, is, is good, just, and true. Think through what's going on to be pleasing to the Lord. Work it out. So don't get involved in deeds of darkness, which all come along. Instead, expose them. The things they do in secret, you see, are shameful even to talk about. But everything becomes visible when it's exposed to the light, since everything that is visible is light. That's why it says, wake up, you sleeper. Rise from the dead, and the Messiah will shine on you. So take special care about how you conduct yourselves. Don't be unwise, but be wise. Make the use of every opportunity you have, because the times we live in are wicked. Don't be foolish, rather understand what the Lord's will is. And don't get drunk with wine the way that uh, lies dispassion. Rather be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and chanting to your, in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for every, everything to, God and Father of, to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so I want to share with you this morning Three things that, that um, God calls us to walk, and he calls us to walk, and this is what he calls us as a new humanity. He calls us to walk in love, to walk in light, and to walk in wisdom. And the first one is to walk in love. And he said, so you should be imitators of God like dear children. Conduct yourselves in love just as the Messiah loved us and gave himself for us as a sweet-smelling offering and a sacrifice to God. Well, that's not a hard standard, is it? Conduct yourself in love just as the Messiah loved us. Be imitators of God. Did you ever Im imitate somebody when you were a kid? One of my heroes when I was a kid is Underdog. Remember Underdog? 
He used to, used to have a cape, and I think he had some kind of long underwear on. I'm not sure. And he would, um, he would wear this cape, and I think he had a U on his shirt or something. And, and he could fly, and he would save the day. And, uh, man, he used to be one of my idols. And so I'd stand on the basement steps with my cape on for, for I don't know how long I did this for. I think, I think I quit probably by the time I was 20, maybe. I'm not sure. And I would stand on, stand on my cape and my underwear with my cape on, and I would jump off. And I thought, one of these days, I'm going to soar like underdog. But it quite never happened that way. But you know, in Jesus, we can soar. But he became one of the people that I, that I looked up to, kind of imitated. But we also imitate our parents. We, become to look, we come to look like and act like our parents. And that can be good and that can be bad. I recognize in my life there are characteristics of my dad in my life that I love. The ability to fix things, to be able to look at something and just see what's wrong with it, which drives my wife crazy sometimes because she'll go, show me how to do it. You know, you just did it. Show me what you did. And I'm like, I'm not sure what I did. I just know it worked. And so that can be you know, one of those irritating things that, that we learn from our parents. I learned from my dad just to care about the least and last and lost. He, he, just, he grew up in a very poor family that didn't have inside toilets until um, the early 60s on a farm in Wisconsin. And so he learned to care about the poor, to care about those who had nothing. And when he worked his way up in the company that he was in, his, his goal was never to be the top dog, was never to be you know, the president, but God in his sovereignty and grace made him president of this Fortune 500 company. And the amazing thing about my dad is he never quit caring about the person at the bottom. I remember one time him going to visit his janitor or his janitor's wife, I can't remember, who was in, who was in the hospital and the janitor, the janitor's wife was so surprised. Like, Verge, what are you doing here? This company had almost 300 people in it. What are you doing here? He just, I just said, wanted to come and see how you were doing. You know, I was just concerned about you. And some of that's come across to me. Some of it, the love that I saw in my mom. When she poured out her grace and mercy in the neighborhoods that she walked, she grew up with two addicted sons, one son who was very seriously mentally ill. And in that process, she grew, uh, grew in her faith and grew in her grace. And so later on in life, they lived on a lake, and across the street was one of the, it was kind of in the, the, the northern, a little bit further north than Minneapolis, and there was a lot of kind of open land, and there was a guy there who was probably cooking and selling meth, I'm not sure. Um, but I know he was selling it. I don't know if he was cooking it there too. And a bunch of the neighbors said, we should call the police and bust him. And my mom said, let me talk to him some and see if, see if we can do this without having to have him go through the whole system. And so my mom just began loving on this guy. She would go out and talk to him. She invited him over to dinner. She began asking about his life. And slowly, this, this man, she invited him to a Bible study. And the man began coming to this Bible study. And his heart began to be transformed. And very quickly, my mom encouraged him to try out an NA meeting or an AA meeting to try and see if he could get his life together. And he began getting his life back together. And then he began going to church and following Jesus, which he's doing to this day, I believe. And that was the kind of love that I was shown. I was shown that's how, that's how you witness to people. That's how you win people into the kingdom. That's how you, you um, bring the light into the darkness. It wasn't by shouting at it. It was by loving it. And so those were things that, that I grew up with. But, but Paul even gives us a higher model of that. He said, look at your father. How would your father react in this situation? Or literally, WWJD, the old bracelet thing. What would Jesus do in this context? What would Jesus do in this context? Conduct yourselves in love, just as Messiah loved us and gave himself for us a sweet-smelling offering and sacrifice to God. The Messiah loved us, and part of love is giving. He gave himself. 
And that can be some really simple things during these days of the pandemic. It can be just helping clean up the house. It can be just being kind to each other, that you're the, very, the few people that you might be able to be close to. It can be beginning to look into your life and saying, am I really, if you're having marital problems or whatever, am I really, what, not, not what are they doing, but what am I doing? Am I acting like Jesus? And if not, how can I get to that place where I don't just on the outside act like Jesus, but on the inside become transformed like Jesus, that I become like a tree that begins bearing good fruit? And that isn't just trying to, you know, white-knuckle it through the, the bad behaviors that I have. And so the first call for us is to walk in the love of God in this world. What does it look like to be a Christian? We, we're people who walk in the grace and love of God. We look like our parents. One writer writes this, Believers have been adopted into God's family and should exhibit family resemblances. It would be incongruous for God, to be God's dearly loved children and not to want to become like one's loving father. In fact, the new child-father relationship not only requires but enables imitation to take place. As children live their lives out of love, they have already experienced from their father. We've already experienced that love. We know what it tastes like. We know what it looks like to be forgiven when we don't deserve forgiveness to be shown mercy when we don't deserve to be shown mercy. And this isn't something that just happens, you know, one time in our life at the beginning. It happens over and over again where God just shows us his mercy. Walking in chil as children, and my next part is that we walk as children of light. We're walking as children as, of light. He says, as for fornication, uncleanness, uncleanliness, any kind of greed, you should... Shouldn't even mention them. You are, after all, God's holy people. Shameful, stupid, or coarse conversations are quite out of place. Instead, there should be um, thanksgiving. You should, should know this, you see. No fornicator, who, those who practices uncleanness, uncleanliness, no greedy person, in other words, idolater, has any inheritance in the Messiah's kingdom or in God. Don't let anyone fool you with empty words. It's because of these things that God... God's wrath is coming. And so the, first, the second aspect of, of walking out this Christian life in this world is that we walk in the life, that we're distinctive. We're not distanced. I remember one friend telling me they went to their I don't know, 10th or 15th class, class anniversary, and some of the people had become Christians. And they were all cloistered over in the corner, and they were sitting there, and two of my friends who were Christians who were like some of the first druggies on our block, and then they, they, they got wrecked and became Jesus freaks, you know. They, they, they were the first people to come to know Jesus, too. They were at their, this was their uh, class reunion, and they said they were sitting there with all these people, these Christians in this huddled mass, and they were going, what are you guys doing? And they said, well, everybody's got their lives really messed up. We're just kind of sitting here, you know. We're thankful that God has rescued us, and we're kind of, they said, that isn't how this works. Look at this opportunity. You have a whole class of people that you could share your story with or you could listen to their story. And Paul says that, that those, that lifestyle is completely contrary to the lifestyle of God. Fornication, uncleanliness, greed. It's interesting, he puts greed in there too, isn't it? And in some ways they're all the same. They're all trying, they're all a means of trying to find satisfaction from something that ultimately wasn't designed to give us ultimate satisfaction. Paul puts it this way in Romans. Although they knew God, they neither glorified him God nor gave him thanks, but in their thinking became futile and foolish and their hearts were darkened. And although they claimed to be wise, they became foolish and exchanged the glory of the immortal God from images made to look like mortal human beings, birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over to their sinful desires, to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the created things rather than the Creator 
who is to be forever praised. And I think the reason that Paul is using these illustrations of that he starts out with the, the, the sexual stuff and then the greed stuff is because those are two things, um, especially sexuality, that, that ultimately are beautiful, wonderful things. They're things that, that come close to what our relationship with God is supposed to be like. They have such a deep fulfillment possibility in them. That they are the, the easiest thing to twist and to get to people to worship. Do you understand? I mean, if God told us not to drink gas, you know, we'd be like, oh, okay, got it, you know. And of course, when I was younger, that, you know, I had to try something like that. Um, see if you could blow it out, light a match, see what would happen. Don't do that at home, kids. It doesn't work. Look what happened to me. Um, but... You know, he doesn't, he doesn't have to command us not to eat dog poop. At least most people. Why? Well, because we don't even want to. You know, it's not, it's not pleasing to us. It's not desiring. Most, most temptations are, come from things that are actually beautiful and good, but have been warped and twisted. The more beautiful and glorious something is, the more possible it is for it to become an idol because it replicates what and who God is or the pleasure that we're intended to receive from God so much that it's, it's almost the perfect counterfeit, but not quite. Paul has a way of cutting to the heart of the issue. Don't be fooled, he says. There are a lot of empty words out there, words that which sound big and important, words which echo and resonate in our culture, but with have nothing lasting inside of them, no life, no truth, precisely because sex is good in import, and an, an important part of God's creation, of the animal kingdom, and of humans within it, precisely because it is the means of tenderness and intimacy between a husband and wife, as well as the means of a God-given procreation, precisely because... It is the occasion for great blessing and emotional fulfillment. Because of all of these, people on the road to genuine human existence promised in Christ must avoid all cheap imitations. Casual sex or sex outside the boundaries of what God has defined. You know, God created sex, people. God isn't, you know, sometimes people read the Bible and they go, God is really against sex. And I'm thinking, are you kidding me? God made it. I mean, just think about the creative mind of God. He created sex. Part of it is for procreation. He knows that. And he could have made procreation just a, you know, a very scientific thing that had no pleasure involved in it whatsoever. But he didn't. He wanted to be a culmination of a man in union coming into union together like Christ and his bride and out of that union birthing beauty and life like Charlie and Tracy just did. Again and again and again. Paul has a way of cutting to the heart of the issue. Casual sex is a parody of the real thing, like drinking from a muddy stream instead of fresh, clear water, or listening to a symphony on a damaged record player when a world-class orchestra is playing around the corner. Don't be satisfied with cheap imitations. And I, you know, I pastored long enough to know that this is a big issue for people, people in and outside of the church. It's a big issue for men in particular in the church. The pornographic issue has just skyrocketed. And, and I think, you know, I could do a lot of guilt things on people right now. Because, you know, pornography feeds sex trafficking. You know, it feeds this. It's one of the most lucrative businesses in the world, to be honest. And it feeds all kinds of horrendous things. And it's such a, a destruction of God's beauty. And I know some of you are stuck in that kind of cycle of, of Internet porn. You get stuck in it. You know why that happens? I'm going to get a little technical with you for a minute here as we begin to wrap this up. It's because it does something chemically in your brain. Your brain is designed to have all these senders and receptors, these neurons, 
and neuropaths that your brain goes through. It's designed for all of those things. Jim's standing right in front, so I look more at the mic. But then I have to look at you, Jim. You just say... <laughs> so, I should have Teresa stand there, then I'd look there more. Um, <laughs> so, you know... Dop your body produces this thing called dopamine. And one, one um, scientific journal says this, just as drugs produce intense euphoria, and so does sexuality, and so does gambling, and so does so many other things that, that stimulate us, they, they produce such large surges of dopamine, powerfully reinforcing the connection between consumption of the drug, the resulting pleasure, because they're, they're tricking your body into increasing those pleasure um, neurons and the pleasure receptors get really confused and eventually those pleasure receptors kind of shrink themselves. This is a real broad, probably somewhat, un, you know, I'm not explaining exactly right, but I'm doing the best I can. But it, it shrinks those neural receptors in your brain um, to, tr be, to try and limit how much of this is coming in so that when you're not doing that, when you're not watching the porn, when you're not doing the drug, when you're not, you know, shooting up using heroin, whatever, when you're not doing that, your body feels lower than it did as a normal normal. The resulting pleasure and all the external clues, clues linked to it, large surges of dopamine, teach the brain to seek drugs at the expense of other healthier goals and activities. And what ends up happening is they mimic working with somebody once who had started out just by looking at internet porn of like cheerleaders or something. And by the time he got to me, he was spending about four or five hours a day. He had lost his job. He lost his wife. He couldn't even have sexual relations with his wife because it was just gone. He had, he had destroyed some of those neuropaths. Now, I believe that God can regenerate them, and they've shown that, that a lot of those paths can be regenerated. Once you get sober, you can begin to start seeing those change. And sometimes people need... to take a, a SSRI or something when they first get sober, when you're first trying to get off pornography or whatever, just to help balance out some of the imbalances in your brain. But basically, idolatry, idolatry affects us physically. It destroys some of the neuropaths. in our brain just like heroin that's why people have such a hard time getting off porn if you're having a hard time getting off porn or getting off some sexual brokenness stuff and this is something we all struggle with I'm not going to stand up here and go well thankfully for the last 42 years I've never looked at a woman lustfully not the fact is it's a struggle we all have but it's something, too, that God, I believe, enables us to overcome. And in the middle of this, Paul says, don't speak with coarse and jesting words and all those things, but be thankful. Use thanksgiving. Why does God, why does God do that? It's because God wants us to be ultimately happy. Do you realize that God's ultimate goal in our life, his ultimate goal with sexuality, with food, with all those things that we overuse sometimes, is to, to have them be something that gives us pleasure. But they in themselves, the problem with them giving us pleasure is that eventually they in themselves become the God. We worship the creation rather than the creator. We begin to not see God as the one who ultimately gave these things to us and that they're part of the creation. They're not the epitome or the pinnacle of creation. He is the pinnacle of creation. He is the creator of creation. And out of him, all the goodness flows. Psalm 16 says this, and it's so beautiful. 
Because most people don't realize. There was a book that just completely transformed my idea of what Christianity was. It was by John Piper. And it was called Desiring God, Meditations of a Christian Hedonist. And in it, he kind of paraphrases um, uh, C.S. Lewis's idea that, that um, the, our problem isn't that we desire too much, it's that we are satisfied with way too little. Lewis says this, which I think is um, pretty, pretty much amazing. I don't know if I have it in here now. <laughs> but anyway, uh, Lewis's kind of quote was, was that we're like children playing in, in the, making castles in the mud in the slum when God is offering us a, a beautiful castle by the sea. We're, we're far too easily pleased. We're far too easily pleased by things. And God wants us to go way beyond those simple pleasures that bring us into addiction and for us to come into the ultimate joy and satisfaction of a deep relationship with him. Then everything else lines up. Then we can begin having a normal life in every other aspect of life. Until then, we will never have that kind of normalized life. And one of my goals in life is to get to that place where, where my satisfaction and my joy and my ultimate happiness, all of which God desires. In fact, it says in Psalm 16, For therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoice, my body will also rest secure, because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful ones see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You fill me with joy in your presence and with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Do you know what we have, what God has waiting for us? It's not harps and pillows and clouds and stuff like that. It's eternal pleasures at God's right hand. What does God want for you? To give you pleasure and joy, but in the right way. And so that's part of the reason that God starts out that our walk with God needs to be in the light. Our culture is much like ancient Rome. Ancient Rome idolized sex. And yet the people that reach that top pinnacle of you know, and being involved in orgies or all that kind of stuff em ultimately ended up coming away empty. There used to be a couple movies out. I think one of them was called Ten or something like that. And there's a couple other ones like that where these guys were fantasizing about the ultimate you know, woman or sexual experience that would give them ultimate satisfaction. And when they actually got it, they were left empty because it wasn't. It didn't fill up that deepest need in their life. Instead, we're to walk as children of light. He says this, in that same passage. Let me get back to my same passage. So take special care. He says, so don't share in their practices. All of you at one time were darkness. Not that you just practiced darkness, but you were darkness. All of us were broken. All of us were completely even, our, even the things we did for good were done with the wrong motives. And we don't just need to be have a new paint job. You ever go to buy a used car that just looks beautiful on the outside, and then you take a magnet, or after like two months of owning it, you realize that underneath all that paint is just a bunch of rust. God doesn't want us to be just a bunch of rust on the beautiful on the outside and rusty on the inside. At one time you were darkness, but now you are light. In the Lord you are light. We are light. Before as a Christian, I used to be able to know who Christians were because I could see literally a light on them. Light has its fruit, doesn't it? And everything that's good and just and true, think through what's been pleasing to the Lord, work it out. So don't get involved in works of darkness which come to nothing. Instead, expose them. 
The things they do in secret, you see, are shameful even to talk about. But everyone, everything that come, becomes visible when it's exposed to the light, everything that is visible is light. That's what it says. Wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and the Messiah will shine on you. The Messiah will shine on you. He's speaking of our baptisms, of our resurrection, of the transformation which God does in our lives and may, brings us, makes us from darkness to light. You are, if you've received Jesus, you're children of the light. You may not wake up every day and say, hey, I'm a child of the light. This morning I woke up and I was just grumpy. I didn't feel like a child of the light. But deep inside, God's done something in your lives and is doing something. And if you haven't experienced that, I would challenge you to encourage it. I would encourage anybody here this morning who's listening in video or in the, in the sanctuary to, to really look at your heart and say, are you just trying to do all these things to get to become a Christian? Or are you do the, doing these things because you already know that you're loved and saved and that, that you are a Christian and that these are distinctive lifestyles of a Christian that hopefully will help our society get back on track? Last of all, we walk in wisdom. So take special conduct about yourselves. Don't be unwise, but wise. Make the use of every opportunity we have because the days are wicked. This week I was praying because one of my, two of my cars actually, you know, cars are the beauty and bane of humanity. I love cars, but God always reminds me not to make them an idol because there's always something happening to them, so. So two of my cars kind of went down, and Bethany, my daughter's car, really went down. So I let her use my car, which the heater fan is not really working in. But her car, the brakes were bad, and the, um, she had a bunch of other semi-major stuff around with it. So I was just praying. I was thinking, I hate working outside in the cold, Lord. Show me what to do. And so I just kind of felt like maybe I was supposed to work on it myself. And, I'm, you know, I'm hating that because it makes my knees and my arthritis and all that stuff. I'm getting old. <laughs> Sound like a grumpy old Minnesota man. But I was, I was just doing all this stuff, and it was, you know, it was kind of cold and miserable. And the whole time I'm feeling a little guilty, like, well, Lord, there's so much more kingdom stuff I should be doing right now. But then I thought, well, if this was somebody who was in dire need in our church, I would be doing it for them, and I should at least be able to do that for my own daughter. And so I, I'm getting it all fixed, and I just about have it done, and there's one part I wanted the mechanic to help me with. So I went to the mechanic, and I... You know, I was waiting to have him just work on these two bolts that had gotten frozen in. And while I'm waiting there, I get a call from Teresa, and I thought she was joking. And she said, honey, I'm on the road, and my, my engine's smoking. And I'm like, what's smoking? That's a really bad habit, you know? Now we've got, we got to spend another, another eight bucks a day for cigarettes for the car. That's really bad. Um, but anyway, um, so, so I... Uh, Anyway, I, I said, well, just pull over. So she pulls over, and I go over, and there's just steam coming up from a car, and I can tell right away that the, one of the lines in the radiator is cracked or something. And I thought, you know what? There's no way I can be doing three cars at the same time. So I brought that one into the shop, which is ended up going to BMW, which is great service, but they, um, they have an the immediate charge of at least $1,200, and this happened to be more than that. So, so I got that working, but I thought, you know, but I, the reason I'm saying this is because my thought was, Lord, what, how do you want me to spend my day today? I want to spend it wise, not unwise. I don't want to spend all these years of my life on unwise things. I want to, I want to do something that makes a difference. I'm 62. I don't know how many years I have left. That's what Cicely Tyson says, said in here in her beautiful autobiography, Just As I Am, she says, I don't know how many years I have left, but I want to spend those years in, in just pouring myself out into your kingdom and into your life and doing that which is pleasing to you. And don't get drunk with wine. And all wine does is it, it, it kind of tamps down all the problems you have in life. It kind of just pushes them out of your brain. It doesn't make them go away. It just makes you avoid them. And then he contrasts that with being filled with the Spirit. And the difference between being drunk with wine and filled with the Spirit isn't like you filled with the Spirit, you're walking around like you're drunk or something like that. He's not talking about that. He's talking about one thing filling your mind and, and pushing to the side or just avoiding or being in denial of all the pain in your life. 
The other thing, being filled with the Spirit, focuses you on all the resources. Not, it doesn't, doesn't negate all the problems you have, but it, it gives you a better picture of all the resources God has to fix those problems. That's what being filled with the Spirit is. And I think it's something we have to do and ask God for all the time. Fill me with your Spirit, O Lord. Fill me with your gifts. Or if you're a person that speaks in tongues, stir that up and pray that with yourself. You know, use that gift to, to encourage yourself. Speak to each other in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and chanting in your hearts to the Lord, always giving thanks to the Lord for everything, to God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Starts where it ends, always giving thanks. What's the antidote to all of this? Always giving thanks, keeping the Creator in the beautiful place where he's supposed to be. Teresa's grandma used to all the time walk around like um, uh, hum humming these hymns. She just hummed hymns all the time. And it wasn't because her life was easy. She had seen two husbands die, had seen one out in the cold northern part of Minnesota. She lost one of her her sons at a very young age to, I believe, leukemia or some kind of a cancer. And yet, she was one of the most joyful people that I've ever known. In fact, used to be, a, I would go to her house sometimes with Teresa before I was a Christian. It was a little freaky because I think there were literally, that there were angels in and surrounding that house. And I could feel something different about that place. And the house was filled with light and eventually that light began to permeate my heart and begin to change me. And it exposed all those things in my heart that were just really broken. And so when I finally came down to it, like with my, when I first came to a, a conversion and to a relationship with Jesus, my conversion was basically saying, Jesus, I am all yours. All my sexual promiscuity, all the stuff that I've believed, all the practices that I've had all these years, I give to you. I give to you my, my sex. I give to you my life. I give to you my all. I surrender it all, Lord, Lord. And then God began to show me what true joy and satisfaction is. And so as a church, I'm just going to end with this, just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou biddest me to come, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Just as I am tossed about, with many conflict, many doubt, fighting fears within, without, O Lamb of God, I come. Just as I am waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blot, to thee whose blood can cleanse each spot, O Lamb of God, I come. Just as I am, poor wretched blind, sight, riches, healing of the mind, yea, all I need I find, in thee I find, O Lamb of God, I come, just as I come, thou wilt receive, wilt welcome, pardon, cleanse, relieve, because thy promise I believe, O Lamb of God, I come, because thy promise I believe, O Lamb of God, I come. Lord, today, may we be that counter kingdom, that kingdom of light in a dark world. May we be gracious as, as just by our lifestyles we reflect the light of your gospel. And may it shine in people's lives so that they feel, um, they feel your presence, see your presence. And may your presence bring them to a place of being transformed by that light, out of darkness into light. May we be able to do that even while we're doing this. May those out there, any of those out there, any of those in here who haven't, let that light all the way shine into the deepest parts of their heart. Would you open your hearts up today and let God shine in? Would you let his spirit come and touch those places? Would you go and speak to another friend or another Christian about the dark places in your life that you don't want to have there anymore and then hold yourself accountable? Let us be children of light, emulating, imitating our Father. May we go this week with changed hearts and changed lives and changed attitudes. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
God, thank you.